Hello and welcome to Lesson 12 in Basics of Biblical Archaeology. With this lesson, we're going to talk about the Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrakan. It's an important inscription that helps attest to the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites at the end of the 15th century under Joshua. In our last lesson, we talked about the site of Lachish, and we focused on the Israelite period, especially in the first millennium BC, with the attack under Sennacherib and the, the attack under the Neo-Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. But now we want to go back all the way to the 15th century BC, when we had um, the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the Israelites. So we want to look at the story behind this first, which is found in Joshua chapter 10. So let's look at the text. Here's what it reads in Joshua 10, verses 31 and 32. Then Joshua and all of Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish, and they, capped, and they camped by it and fought against it. He who is, that's the covenant name of God, delivered Lachish into the hands of Israel. So he, that is Joshua, captured it on the second day, and he struck it and every person who was in it with the edge of the sword, according to all that he had done to Libna. So we see two very important things in this very brief narrative that are useful in our understanding of what happens at the site archaeologically. First, it says that they, they, fought, uh, that they moved on to the site of Lachish, and they, after camping by it, fought against it. So it wasn't just a battle between Joshua or between his army and the king and the, 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 the followers of the king who were somewhere else. They had already defeated the king by this time, the king of Lachish. But at this point, they weren't going after the king. They were going after the city. So they fought against the city itself. So there's an attack on the site of Lachish. Second, it says that they captured it on the second day, uh, which means it took them a while to complete the conquest of Lachish. It was such a city of, of such greatness that one day wasn't enough. The, next, the very next site that they went after and attacked, it says that on that very same day, on that first day, they were able to capture the city. But the fact that it took a second day to overcome Lachish suggests to us that this was a much more formidable city and it took more time for them to be able to secure a victory. And that's because Lachish is such a massive site and requires uh, so much effort to be able to make it, first of all, up to the very uh, wall itself, but then to penetrate the wall and get through. So we don't know exactly from the text how God helped the Israelites to be able to uh, overtake uh, the site of Achish. All we know is that it took them a second day unlike um, the other days around it. So this was indeed a formidable city and a great victory. But our focus is going to be on an inscription that was found at the site that dates to this very same moment, the end of late Bronze Age 1B, around 1406. And um, let's start with a little glimpse of the location and the date, just as a refresher, in case it's been a while since you've watched the video on uh, Lesson 11 and Lachish. So this is the site of Lachish. Um, we're essentially looking at it uh, with north facing up. It's, a, it's slightly um, pointed toward the east, but mainly north. So this basically becomes the western part of the site. We know of the ramp, as we saw in our last lesson, that allows the ascent up to the outer gate and then the entry into, into the city through the inner gate that's in, right in here. And our focus is going to be on area S for this inscription because that's where it's found. It's only found in one certain location on the site, and that is here within this area of excavation. And maybe you can see the little red lines. That represents the area of the actual excavating that the archaeological team did, and it's led by Felix Heffelmeyer, uh, an Austrian archaeologist. So th in this area, they excavated where uh, the wall was. So you can see, very importantly, the inner wall 
right? The inner wall runs uh, through area S. And it's right along the inner wall where this inscription was found, just inside the wall. Last lesson, we talked about the overall stratigraphy of the site, its history. Today, we're just going to focus on a part of that, and that is um, looking at the uh, late Bronze Age 1B right here. So according to my dates for this time period, I date this to 1484 to 1406 BC for this substratum. And the substratum from which the inscription comes is S3B, which becomes very important. And there are several things that we see going on uh, at the site at this time, and even especially at this very location in Area S, we see several things happening. First of all, we see that there was a city wall um, that, was, um, uh, that was built. So by the time of the inscriptions um, writing, the city wall was already in existence, and Building 100 was in existence, and that's the building from which it was found. It was retrieved from Building 100. And then also we have the Foss Temple dating to this time, and it's, it's essentially built during this phase, the Foss Temple. In our last lesson, we talked about the Foss Temple being located outside the city walls. For whatever reason, it was built outside the city. And that Foss Temple gives us um, a you know, physical record of some of the artifacts that would have been um, true and, and um, standard for the day at Lachish at this time period, dating to late bronze 1B. So that's where we fit in the history of the tell. Uh, stratum S3B and the period of late Bronze Age 1B. Now let's look at the stratigraphy of the site to show us, relatively speaking, where this period shows up and what's in the, in the archaeological subperiods around it. So within this image, we see a few things going on. The darkest areas here, 11, wall 1127 and 1027, were built from the beginning of this phase and lasted throughout the entire phase. Then the wall was built at the beginning of the phase too and it's lighter colored showing that it was built in, in subphase S3C. So the city wall is 1220 and it's a very thick wall. Um, this is the western direction so it's attacking, it's protecting from an attack from invaders from the western flank. So that's 1220 but it doesn't last for the entire period of um, this subface. It goes out of use, unlike these walls, 1127 and 1027, they end up being used after um, this subphase, um, S3C, and the next one, S3B, after those two subphases, uh, the wall goes out of existence. And what happens is, uh, what you see in yellow, these represent walls, that are built up against these other walls afterward, after there's been a destruction of the city and uh, a, an a short occupational gap. And at that point, the walls that had remained and hadn't been destroyed were borrowed. And like, for example, um, this wall here was borrowed by adding another wall to it. And um, this wall here was borrowed by adding another wall to it. And so, uh, the, the occupants of the city were taking advantage of um, the walls that, that hadn't been knocked down and then uh, building their own homes or rooms using existing walls and just adding any walls that needed um, to be um, added. But it's so important to note that the city wall in this last subphase, which is S3A, highlighted by walls created in, S, in yellow, that, that the city wall was not in use for that last subphase. The find spot for the inscription is right here, where this little um, diamond shape is, this, this um, triangle. That's the find spot, but it's not on the ground. This is a, an, um, a drawing that's made as if looking down from above, so it's a, a fully bird's eye view, straight down, and it shows you straight down where you'd see it, but that gives you no depth where it was recovered um, from the ground. It wasn't found on the ground floor. It was found on top of debris, and uh, it was found in the midst of, right against, a burn layer. 
So there was something that was destroyed by fire and the inscription was connected to it, if you will. Not physically, but it was resting on it or alongside it. And then, um, and, and, and then there was fill on top of it and things were built above that that represent this final occupation during the late Bronze Age I uh, for a very brief time. Now, this image gives you a little bit better um, picture to, to understand the depth uh, height-wise within this area because it's looking not quite 45 degrees, but more or less at 45, a 45 degree angle. So some of the walls that we saw in that depiction we can see here. For example, and most importantly again for us, 1220 right here. That's the city wall. So the city wall um, exists, uh, and this is, so we're, we're um, west oriented here at this point. So outside of the wall, if you were to hop over that wall, you'd be traveling west. And inside, of course, to the east, inside the city. So here are um, rooms within this um, um, building 100 and the fine spot for the inscription is off the ground it's about this high um, and it is in an area that gives you a, the view of something that's really important and we'll go back in at our last slide and, and confirm this but um, this the fine spot here shows that there's a part of the city wall that if you look at it uh, the city wall that's been preserved here it's at this height and then it dips down here and you see uh, right here that many of the same stones that should be much higher, and I've represented that with at least the height of that yellow bar there, that's how tall it should be, how high it should be. But this shows that there's a breach um, in wall 1220, which is very low at this area. So that breach means somebody breached the wall. And that's confirmed because that same kind of a breach exists in the wall here. Remember, this is still all part of wall 1220, and it should be continuous, but this whole area represents a gap. There's a gap here because um, this is part of that breach that someone entered the city from without um, and made their way in. And let's confirm that from the artist's drawing. You see that very same breach in the wall, in wall 1220, the city wall right here. Uh, it's represented by a lack of, st of stones drawn in like there are elsewhere. So that represents that same breach. But on this view, of course, they can't represent um, that lowering breach that represents this area here. So this signifies that whoever went into the city um, went in among other places and possi possibly entered through other places in the city if there were lots of attackers. But at least one of the places they entered through the city was through the city wall on the western side right at this point because the breach here and here demonstrates that this was an entry point. And so it was right at that entry point that the inscription was found. And that's really important. So let's hold off our thoughts on that for a minute and now go a little bit deeper into a study of the inscription itself. Um, so where does it fit in the strata? S3B is the time period uh, for when this dates to. Building 100, the city wall, um, during this period, the city wall was standing, but you see that S3A, the, the sub-period right after that, um, portions of Building 100 were in use, but there's no city wall. It's, it's no longer used as a defensive measure. So um, this is our time frame for the inscription. And now let's look at the inscription itself and the translation of it. So here's the shot of the inscription. It's actually two sides of the same ostracon. Now, technically, it's a potsherd. Uh, anytime an ancient pot, and they're, of course, made of clay, which is very breakable, and the Bible tells stories about this, we're like clay pots. And the reason is, if there's a clay pot here on top of this little table and it drops to the ground, 99% chance it's going to break because they're just brittle. So clay pots easily break. And so that's why there are potsherds all over in the ancient world. Any site you go to where people lived and continuously occupied it, you'll see potsherds. So a potsherd can be any size or any shape, you know, as long as it represents part of the original vessel. And once it's broken off, in antiquity, what, what would happen is this. 
people would use a potsherd to write something on there. There are all kinds of options for what they could write. They could write something about themselves. They could write something about their situation. Uh, they could write something about um, their trade. You know, you name it. Um, there's lots of options on what you could write on a potsherd. But um, typically, uh, they would either be painted on, the inscription would be painted, as we have in this case, or it could be etched on there. Now, you could obviously, be in the process of making the pot, you could use an in instrument like a stylus to ease, more easily draw something or write something on the, on the soft, wet clay, and it would be easy uh, for that inscription to, um, to survive because once, once you put the uh, pottery in the kiln and fire it, then it would be permanently on there, that, that inscription. But if you have the right kind of clay, you could use some kind of metal material after the, you know, um, after the, the pot is in use and it breaks off and you have a pot shirt, you could scratch into it. So we've seen inscriptions that are the result of scratching. But in this case, uh, this inscription is, is certainly painted with, um, with paint on here. So on the obverse, if you were to take the vessel and look at it from the outside, it's the beautiful part, it's the pretty, pretty part. It represents um, this part of the vessel. So this is um, brown paint that's been painted on probably um, soon after it was fired, and so this is for beautification. Um, and so that's the outside of the milk bowl. Um, in fact, um, it's worth noting that the type of pottery this is, is um, it's a white slip two milk bowl. It's a white slip two milk bowl. And they were not made until late bronze 1B. Um, white slip two cannot be dated to late, late bronze uh, 1A because there's, um, si they're simply not attested in that sub-period. It's only in late bronze 1B that they're attested. So that means it has to be made after the, the beginning of late bronze um, 1B, which I date to 1484. So that's the outside of the inscription. This is um, outside of the vessel. And this would be the inside of the vessel as originally um, uh, fashioned. But once you have the potsherd, of course, um, that side is filled, so you can't really use that for writing purposes. But this side, you can write here. So that's exactly what, um, what they did. So the inscription was written here. There's a letter, there's a letter, there's one, there's one, there's one. And of course, there's a break in the, in the potsherd right here, and that's potentially problematic. Um, and then there's a letter here in the middle, and then there are three letters here. So the original uh, excavating team and their epigrapher, his name, he's an Israeli, and his name is Misgav, they um, suggested that there are two very easily um, um, recognized words on this inscription. And that's definitely true. This word here and this word here. This word here consists of, in fact, I'll show you um, this next slide, which is a representation of my work where I've electronically, using that very good photograph, I've um, carefully used uh, PowerPoint to um, make letters right over top of where there were paint marks from the original letters that were there. So this looks a lot thicker, um, much easier to discern. So this um, view here gives you a little bit better picture of what would have been written there originally. So this is actually um, uh, an I. And let, let me take a step back before we get into this and mention all of these letters are part of the proto-consonantal alphabetic script, which in my first book, The World's Oldest Alphabet, I've identified as being written by and created by Hebrews who, live, who were living in Egypt. And actually, it was, it was Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, we know as Manasseh, who together um, devised the world's first alphabetic script. And they took from the, from the 800 plus signs in the Egyptian sign list of hieroglyphics. They took out 22 to represent consonants in their um, Semitic language of Hebrew, uh, which hadn't been attested in any written form before this. So they essentially created from scratch 
an alphabet, the world's first alphabet. And so what they did in taking hieroglyphs, they would take a hieroglyphic picture, and it's a picture that if you were to look at it as a Hebrew person and conceptualize what you're seeing in the picture, you speak the first sound, the first consonant, of the first letter of that word. So here's an example. This circle is an I, as in E-Y-E. And of course, in English, if we were going to look at that and do the same thing Ephraim and Manasseh did, which is to create a script from it, and we use English, the word E-Y-E, we know it starts with an E, so we would connect this with the E sound, whatever that would be. Well, for them, it's actually a guttural letter. It's known as the ayin letter. And so this is an ayin. And, and actually, ayin is the word for I in Hebrew, E-Y-E. -E. So that starts this word. This is a um, house. This is a house. And the word house in Hebrew is bayit. So bayit, when, you, when you're um, reading a script in this created um, uh, first alphabetic script, and you see the picture of a house, you think bayit, but you only pronounce b. So that's the sound that's made with this. There's a b. This right here, and think in terms of the, the 1900s and uh, saloons and, and saloon doors, where this would be the door of the saloon, and this would be the long hinge along one side, and it, it rises to the top on one end, and it drops to the ground on the other end, and you'd push to swing it open. So that's the idea with this letter. This is a door. Um, and of course, uh, the Hebrew word for door um, starts with the D sound. So you have the, the word here, Eved. The word Eved here, and that means slave or servant. So that's a servant. Um, then down here, that word, um, we have... We have one letter that's used twice on this inscription, here and here. And whether you can tell or not, that's a snake letter, and there are three strokes to it. And in Hebrew, one of the words for snake is nachash. And this is the word they connected, the word picture they connected with the n sound. We would say n, the n letter in English. So nachash makes an n sound, so that's a n. And this right here is the corner of a mouth, and we talked about in this in our last lesson, the corner of a mouth, because the word mouth in Hebrew is pe. So we make the p sound. So um, n and p. And then this last letter here, this is the most, probably the most complex letter that Ephraim and Manasseh created. They needed to make a certain t sound. And actually, there were two t letters in Hebrew. There's the tate and the tau, and this is the tau. So what would they use to make the tau sound? Well, there's a word in Hebrew for a male goat, which is tayish, and that's exactly what this represents. And this doesn't look like a male goat at all, but if you know hieroglyphics, you know that this can represent a male goat because when you write male goat in hieroglyphics, you write usually three um, determinatives at the end of the, sometimes three goats, but you could write um, three uh, determinatives at the end of it that look like a plus sign. And that's an unknown hieroglyph. We don't really know what it is, but it looks like a plus sign. So interchangeably, you could, you could draw out three male goats at the end of the word, or you could draw out three plus sign looking hieroglyphs. Now, the Egyptians often practice something which is a form of abbreviation. For a long, complex word like that, in the right context, they would just take, for example, one of the determinatives, if it was clear enough, and write that for the entire word. So you could draw one picture of a goat, or in this case, one plus sign, and that gives you your male goat letter, which is really taish. So it makes the t sound. So in the, in, the, in the earliest form of written Hebrew, when you see this letter, you're thinking the t of a male goat, taish. So here's what we have, a n and a p, which when, when it's not um, doubled with a doubling doggish, can make the f sound, and then a t sound here. So n, f, t, no fet, no fet. And that's exactly what this is. This is the word no fet in Hebrew, which is honey. So the original excavators correctly 
And in their epigrapher, Misgav, they correctly um, recognize that this is Eved, slave or servant, and that this is Nofet, which is honey. But there's one thing they didn't work at that they really could have that would have made things a lot easier, which is this word here. And you can probably tell that this word is, these letters are all joined. They're all on the same plane, going in the same direction, and in very close proximity. In, in a different plane, if you will, is this word. And of course, this is on its own plane, these three letters that represent one word. But this is on its own plane, too. So we have a, a word consisting of one, two letters. And, though, and that word consisting of two letters, visually, you can probably see this, is on, the, is on a plane that's between these two planes of the first and last word. And in ancient Hebrew, you would never write bottom to top because the Hebrews practiced what the Egyptians practiced, which is you can write right to left, left to right, top to bottom, but never, ever, ever bottom to top. So first word, third word, second word, because it's on the second plane. This is another Agin letter, and part of it's broken off, but there's enough of it there to make it abundantly clear that this letter can't be anything else other than the I, E-Y-E, -E, of the Ayin letter. So that's exactly what it is. It's the Ayin letter right there. Um, so this equals this. It's just that it's in a different word. And then this here, that letter, it could be another snake, but with closer look, you actually can see that it's something different. And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, actually, let's look at it now. So what I've done is I've taken the three letters, this one, this one, and this one, and I've put them together. So this one we're calling H5 because that's the fifth um, letter on the inscription, letter one, two, three, four, five. This is, we don't quite know what it is, so it's, it's in a question mark. And that's six, seven, and eight. So letters five, question mark, and six are what we're going to look at. If you take them as they're drawn and you, and you put something against the bottom of it, and again, we know from H6 that this is a snake. So H question mark is virtually a carbon copy of this. So it almost certainly has to be another rendition of a snake. But... H5 is different when put on a plane. Um, H5, uh, this would be the head of the snake and this would be the head of the snake, but this one, is, it's in a different position. It's as if the face is down against the ground. But with these two, the face of the snake, the N letter, Nahash, because Nahash is snake, it's uh, the normal position of a head that's actually upright. So that suggests to us that this letter, H5, is not a snake letter but it's something else. Well, what is it? The answer is found in um, this and this hieroglyph. These are from the Egyptian sign list. That is a shepherd's crook, uh, one variant of it. And then this is another variant of it. Now, when a Hebrew was writing, and by the way, one of their other letters, the L sound, is from the Hebrew verb lamad, which means it's like a two-sided coin. On one side, it's to teach, and another side, it's to learn. So it can be either one. Um, so the L sound is based on the word lamad, to learn, and they connect that concept of learning with a staff. Why? Because a shepherd teaches with a staff. If it's a child, a shepherd's child, they spank the child on the backside when the child does wrong. If it's a sheep, they prod or pull a sheep using that shepherd's staff. So that is the teaching or learning tool. Therefore, when they see that teaching or learning tool, they think of the verb to teach, to learn, lamad. So they make the l sound. So that's exactly um, what was borrowed, that lamad. And we see it all over in, in, in their inscriptions. Um, there's one inscription from the collection of Sinaitic inscriptions in, in southwestern um, Sinai that were composed by Israelites in Moses' day. And I talk all, all about this. I've translated a number of these inscriptions uh, in the world's oldest alphabet. But um, there, um, one of the inscriptions is called Sinai 378. And there is a L letter, a shepherd's crook, that's written in one of them that doesn't 
reflect the typical shepherd's crook that the average Israelite uses to write. But this one, W2, uh, I'm sorry, V2 on Sinai 378, follows the other variant for the shepherd's crook, which is the one that has a different shape of bend. It's this bend to it. So V2 follows S38 hieroglyph. And on our inscription, the Lachish Milkbal Ostrakhan, the writer followed this very same model in V2 when he was wanting to write um, this kind of curved um, shepherd's crook. So this, isn't, this H5 is a shepherd's crook, crook making the L sound. So what happens when we put that together? We have an Ayin and we have a Lamed. And this, of course, makes a guttural consonant that we really don't make today. And well, we don't make it in English at all. But even when we uh, study ancient Hebrew, we don't usually use it um, when trying to um, speak out the language of what we read, especially in the biblical text. But um, that guttural letter has a vowel that goes with it, and that's the an A class vowel. That is the patek. It makes an A sound. So we have al. That's exactly what's here. Al. Al is a preposition. It's a very simple preposition. It means on, upon, or over in its root meaning. And with, with most words in our language, in their language, in just about any language, you have the root meaning of a word that's like the circle of a bullseye, and then you have rings that go around it that represent derived meaning. And the further uh, the more abstract, the further you get away from the root meaning, and the more abstract it is, um, the more you have to um, kind of um, roll with the punches and understand it's, it's not going to go back to that original concept of on, upon, or over. But we want to understand this in light of the overall inscription. So literally, here's what we have. Servant, on, upon, or over, and then honey. Servant, on, upon, or over, honey. And what works best with on, upon, or over? Probably over, because it's giving us some overlap with our concept of over in English. The servant who was over, honey. So that's our essential meaning there. The servant who is over, honey. So the idea is this. There's a person who had the role of serving, he was a part of, and I connect this to uh, the conquest under Joshua. Um, so once they went into the land and they started attacking cities and overpowering cities, except for Jericho, they were taking any of the products that they found and, and collecting them and then consuming them. And if, obviously, if it wasn't a consumable, then they would put it in their satchel or whatever, in their bag or or whatever, put it on a cart and carry it away. And if it was something that could be used, they would use it. But they evidently already were confiscating um, jars full of honey because it was the, uh, the harvest season, the perfect season for being able to, you know, for the Canaanites to be able to find honey. So evidently Canaanites had, um, um, had uh, places where they were, you know, um, growing this honey, and they would collect the honey from it, put it in a jar and whatever, and when the Israelites would attack the city, they would collect this and, and store it. So one person would have been put in charge of the honey, and that person's title would be servant of honey. So that's the translation of the inscription, and we'll come back to that in a minute. The final thing we'll look at on the inscription is this, that central single by itself unique letter. And what does that mean? It's not part of any word because there are no one letter words that I know of, at least in Hebrew. So that takes us back to this concept that I understood after having deciphered and translating um, a number of these um, pictographic inscriptions, these proto-consonantal Hebrew inscriptions that the Hebrews were making. Every once in a while, one would be made where there is a picture and they followed the rule that the Egyptians used, which is if there is a, uh, a, some, something in writing and there is a picture of something and a text near it, then 100% of the time the text will relate to the picture. That's over and over and over. I could show you example after example in both Proto-Continental Hebrew and in Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics. 
Um, so most likely what's going on here is this. The N letter here in the middle of this inscription is probably a one-letter abbreviation. And on other inscriptions uh, um, that I've translated, I've recognized very, very occasionally, but once in a blue moon, that there is such a, uh, an abbreviation. So if that's an abbreviation, and if, the, if it represents a drawing, and the drawing is in the middle of the inscription, then the drawing connects to the overall inscription. So the N uh, sound, the N sound here, has to relate to the, um, the overall meaning uh, of what's on this potsherd. And that is that this is the servant over or in charge of honey. So what could it mean as a one-letter abbreviation? Probably, since the focus is on the servant, it represents who he is, most likely by name. And certainly in Egyptian, whenever you would have um, a, um, a name, you, you almost invariably would have a title with it, if the person had a title. You put the title first and then the name, and it's always in that format. So probably this is an abbreviation of the name of the person who is um, the, the one overseeing uh, the collection of honey to be able to distribute it to the other Israelites so they're all able to, um, to consume part of that honey. So what his name was, we have no idea. Again, it's like saying, you know, I'm going to abbreviate my name. And my name, of course, starts with a D, my first name, Doug. So if I put a D and you see that, you don't know what that means. Is it Dan? Is it Doug? Is it Derek? What is it? So there's all kinds of options. Nathaniel is an option. Actually, Nachash, the word snake, that's the name of a person uh, in biblical times in Hebrew. So there's all kinds of options. We don't know the person's name, but probably that's what it refers to. So, what do we have here? We have an inscription from the end of late bronze one. Right from the very time that the breach in the wall shows us is the destruction of late bronze one B Lachish, this massive, powerful, well-fortified city that the Bible says was overtaken by the Israelites on the second day, which having looked at the, the defeat of Lachish under the Neo-Syrians that probably took months to besiege the city, this suggests that God was somehow involved in this process to help them uh, take it in the second day. The Bible doesn't tell us how Lachish was taken. It tells us how Jericho was taken and one or two other cities, but not this city. So somehow, they, uh, through God's help, they, they overpowered um, the fortifications there. And probably the Israelite army flooded inside through various, not just one breach in the wall, but various breaches in the wall. They went in, they killed everyone with a sword, man, woman, and child, and any animals that were in the city. And they um, burnt parts of it here or there. The Bible doesn't say it was a city that was burnt, but it doesn't say that it, it wasn't burnt. So evidently, from, from the, where the inscription was found and the fact that it's in the midst of this um, um, burnt debris material, evidently, at least right there in area S, there was some burning that went on. So the Israelites go in, they breach the wall, uh, they go in and then they uh, kill everyone who's there. And then this one guy who's part of the army, apparently, this servant uh, in charge of honey, he has his business card in his back pocket. And on his way out, uh, when the city is, you know, um, still smoking from the burning that had gone on, um, and, and, and probably cinders are, are still going up, and maybe some fire is, is uh, ablaze somewhere, he takes that business card out of his back pocket, for whatever reason, we have no idea, and he drops it right on his way out when he goes right through that breach in the wall that was used to allow his comrades to come in and raid the city. He drops it there, leaves the city, and never comes back. We have no idea why he dropped it there. We have no idea why he would have a business card with his own title on it, but he did. There's no, there's no reason that we have to um, explain why he did it, but he did. And so this represents a part, a physical part, of the conquest under Joshua. And it's the first 
epigraphical record we have of a moment in the land of Canaan when the Israelites as a nation are supposed to be there according to biblical chronology. And this inscription verifies that indeed they were in the land because they left behind this inscription, which by the way, represents um, an important um, minor modification in the history of the script. And that's this. You see this pay letter here? This is the first example that we have of the mouth letter that's not a full mouth. In other words, all the inscriptions from Egypt and Sinai that have that pay letter, the p sound, the mouth on it, it's the full mouth that's um, almost ovular with points on the end. It, it's that full mouth uh, that, that's represented um, when they write the letter. Only here for the first time, after the 40 years in the wilderness, where we have no inscriptions yet attested, only here do they, do they abbreviate that full mouth and take away more than half of it and leave just a corner of that mouth to make the p letter and the p sound, the p letter. So that demonstrates paleographically that we have this, this um, expected slow and gradual evolution, if you will, of the script. So it fits perfectly in, in the history of writing, the writing of the proto-consonantal script, because it represents a middle form that would ev evolve into um, other derived forms with um, a number of the other letters in the alphabet. So the Lachish Milkball Ostrakan is a very important um, ostrakan. You can read more about it in my article. I wrote a journal, journal article on this and published it in Bible and Spade in 2022. In fact, here's the title of the article, A Hebrew Inscription from Joshua's Conquest at Lachish, Bible and Spade, Issue 35-1, 2022, pages 16 to 22. So, inscriptions like this are extremely important because they're found in archaeological finds, and they can give us a taste of what happened in the ancient world according to the very mouths of the people themselves because they've um, communicated something for themselves, in this case, on a piece of pottery. But it tells us so much based on what's on it, what the script is like, where it was found, what, that was, ha what was happening at the site where it was found at the time, and it clues us in uh, to this uh, conquest under Joshua. So it's a very powerful tool, an ancient inscription. So I hope you've enjoyed our lesson on the Lachish Milk Bowl Ostrakan. We'll see you next time.